Good morning, everyone. If you want to grab your seats, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, let's start with good morning again. Good morning, everyone. Glad to have you here. Welcome to One Million Cups. Um, I'm one of the organizers. My name is Milton, and I'm here with Courtney, uh, Brian, and Britton, and we want to welcome you here today. Uh, who's here for the first time? All right. So if you're here from either Piper or Turner, if you're here with the student body, just kind of wave and say hello. We want to welcome you especially. Thank you. Let's give them a round of applause for coming today. All right. So One Million Cups, what we are um, is a program hosted and founded by the Kaufman Foundation. Essentially what we do each week is we have two presenters come and tell us about their journey um, and what it took to get there and where they are today. Um, they'll present for about six minutes, and then we open it up to the audience for Q&A for about 25 minutes. And if you've got a question, uh, just raise your hand. We'll be moving around with microphones, and we'll try to get to you as quick as we can. We typically start those questions with our guest uh, panelists. If you could, please, uh, we've got a microphone for you there. If you want to just stand up, uh, say hello, introduce yourselves, please. Okay. Oh, that's loud. Sorry. <laughs> I'm John Fine. I'm Managing Director with Techstars. Uh, Techstars is a startup accelerator. Um, if you um, haven't heard of Techstars before, we run about 20 programs around the world. And I run the accelerator that's here in Kansas City in partnership with Sprint. Uh, so I've been with Techstars for about two years. I've been in KC for about 10. And uh, I've been previously, I've been a part of five different startups, one of which I co-founded. And I just really love working with startups, helping them however I can. And actually, we're about to embark on our third program here in KC, and our applications are currently open. So there's a little bit of info on the handout, but if you are part of a startup and you're interested in applying, I would strongly urge you to do that. Our website is sprintaccelerator.com. So check us out. Thanks for having me. Good morning, I'm Stephen Fuller. Uh, my company with my brother is Fuller Creative LLC. We're a brand development and marketing agency uh, here in Kansas City. I presented on this stage a handful of times. Uh, we do everything from helping startups to corporations with their brand development. And then also uh, Ignition Effects, uh, which does local special effects, animation, uh, and film production work here in Kansas City. Thanks, John. Thanks, Steve. All right, so before we get started, uh, we want to show you just a quick video um, about our one in a million uh, promo, and then I'm going to have Katie Baker come up and make a quick announcement. From Albany to Albuquerque, Anchorage to Asheville, and Portland to Peoria, 377 One Million Cups entrepreneurs from 58 communities entered the One in a Million Startup Business and Pitch Competition. We've narrowed the field, and now, we are one step closer to one in a million. Tune in on Wednesday, November 18th at 9 a.m. Central to see the top five startups take the stage for a first of its kind event that will be streamed live to all One Million Cup sites. It's one in a million from coast to coast and everywhere in between. Let's welcome Katie Baker from Kaufman here. Good morning, how are y'all doing? Yay! Um, so how many of you guys are planning on being here next Wednesday? I want way more hands than that. Come on. Yes. Okay, awesome. So a couple things about next Wednesday. Um, as you saw in the video, we have 377 people that applied for this competition. We narrowed it down to 15 and they come from nine states. Um, those 15 are going to come in next Tuesday. They're going to be judged. They're going to go through educational process. And then they're going to be narrowed down to a top five. Those five will be the ones that are presenting for you all Wednesday morning starting at 9 a.m. Those five are going to be judged by the CEO of Sprint, the VP of Techstars, and a growth fund partner. So pretty big deal. Um, like I said, it starts at 9 a.m. I want you all to come early if you can. We're really having the program go from 8 to 11. Um, and 8 o'clock is free coffee from the roastery. They're one of our sponsors. Um, breakfast, so 
Yes, you heard right, free breakfast. Um, so make sure you come here for that part. Um, networking with your colleagues, some of the judges, and then make sure you stay for the program from 9 to 11. They'll announce the winners about 11 o'clock, um, and that'll be the end of our program. So make sure you block off the morning. Um, it's a great way to get involved with GEW. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar, GEW starts next week. It goes on throughout the week. We have 90 plus events taking place um, throughout Kansas City. So it's an easy way to get involved. So I hope I see you all there. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. We're going to go ahead and, and bring up our first presenter today who's here to present Furency, uh, which is an innovative social pet work. And with that, I'm going to bring up Chris Nielsen to come and tell us more. Good morning, everybody. How's it going? Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Did everybody get plenty of coffee? OK, that's very exciting. Thank you for having me. I'd like to thank everybody at the Coffin Foundation, our two judges. Um, not sucking up that badly. But anyways, hi. Um, so I'm here to talk about Ferency. Greetings, human one million cups attendees. My name is Christopher Nielsen, and I'm here to speak for those who cannot. Not because of oppression or because of censure, but because of their inability to use our human words. Every day, millions of pieces of domestic animal content are published to social networks the world over, creating engagement that far exceeds the popularity of human-based content. Who gets the credits for those posts published on the furry backs of animals? Humans. That's who. I believe in a world where animals have the opportunity to freely express themselves among other animals and to be recognized for their ability to create compelling animal content. Today, the first step to that world begins. Today, we announce Furency. Furency is the world's first social pet work that allows pets to post their own content in an ecosystem that supports them. By allowing their human pet parents to post on their behalf, Pet users of Furency can be re recognized for their superior cuteness and or cuddliness. As pets use the pet work, they gain digital accolades, or Furency. As pets become more engaging and develop more other following pets, their Furency value will grow, allowing the true stars of the animal world to shine. In Furency, pets are able to chase other pets and interact with the content of the pets they have decided to chase. Future revisions to the platform will allow for influential pets to receive special offers and messages from pet service providers, allowing them to be recognized for how special they truly are. Upcoming location support will allow pets to meet other influential pets in their area and browse location-specific feeds. For pets that live in multi-pet households and have to share a human assistant, Furency allows for one mobile device to toggle seamlessly between multiple pets, allowing the pet parent to give each pet in the home a voice of its own. Additional upcoming updates will allow for multiple human assistants for each pet, sponsored posts, video content, UI improvements, and more options for captioning and labeling, as well as continued improvements to the Furency algorithm. I'm proud to say that this is not just a dream. It will be in the App Store one week from today with Android support on the horizon. So, human people of one million cups, I challenge you, go home next week, download Furency, and give your pet the voice that they deserve. Questions? Thank you, Chris. Thank you. We'd like to go ahead and uh, <coughs> open it up with questions to our panelists first, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Good job. Thank you. So yeah, a couple quick questions. Um, so, so you mentioned it's an app. Is it, is it going to be mobile only, or is it going to be desktop as well? Correct. So um, it will be mobile only focused. The reason for that is pets are on the go type creatures. And the easiest way to capture content as it's happening uh, is for the pet, before it does something cute or cuddly, to direct its human assistant to prepare the mobile device and then, and then take the uh, piece of content. Sure. So, so there are a, a few other sort of similar products out there. <clears throat> Pack is one that's just, I think it's strictly for dogs. And there's a couple of them for cats. And they're, I don't know that they've caught on. You know, I've, they're not really household names, but they do seem to be out there. So 
how do you plan on differentiating yourself from, from some other offerings? You know, that's a great question. Um, at Furency, we believe that all animals should have an equal say in the animal community. So one of our primary differentiators is that all domestic animals can have their own accounts. So cats, dogs, birds, et cetera, can all interact with each other. Um, and then again, as I said in my presentation, Furency was designed from the ground up as a pets first platform um, so that it really allows for um, users that have multiple pets or human assistants that have multiple pets to toggle and shift between them. And then we've got upcoming support so that multiple um, pet parents or pet assistants in a household can manage the accounts for all of those pets, um, features we believe are unique to Furency. Like John said, very well done presentation. I mean, you really you covered the umbrella there. Um, my, my one question, and, and I think you hinted at this a little bit, um, but as a business owner myself, uh, what's, where's your profitability in here right now? Is it, it sounds like there's some advertising options. Are you um, talking about profitability beyond the ability to truly give pets the ability to content post that they crave and be recognized for that? I'm talking about the ability to you keep wearing snazzy shoes and pay your rent. Monetization, that's a great question, that's fantastic. Um, so a couple, a couple points to touch on from a monetization standpoint. Uh, one, obviously, um, he hinted at this that I hinted at. Um, we'll be able to sell access to pet service providers, to pets that amass certain levels of fervency. So based on how much engaging content your pet posts, how frequently it exists, how uh, its content circulates and is supported by other pets within the platform, we'll be able to provide specific offers to, um, to those uh, uh, pets uh, based on their level of engagement. Other opportunities, as I also hinted at, we're adding location support. So we'll have the opportunity not only to do organic pet meetups where pets can all meet at a local dog park with regularity. Um, I hate going to the dog park with, uh, with our CEO, Penny, and, and all of a sudden there's, um, there's nobody there. So we can organize pet meetups. There'll also be the opportunity to organize sponsored pet meetups where a local, uh, for instance, a three-dog bakery can have a, a Sunday pet brunch buffet event. Um, sponsor it and have it um, display in front of local pets in the area so that they can help bring pets to their place of business. So um, that is the first steps or kind of the roadmap we've laid out so far. But uh, we believe that there are many other options that just have not presented themselves to us as well. Got a question for you here in the middle. Yes, sir. All righty. Hey, first of all, hey, Chris, great, great presentation. I would love to hear about Fernsey's ability to connect through Facebook, to connect through Twitter, and possibly, have you thought about Instagram or Pinterest as well? Because I definitely think all the animal lovers on social media would go, would go crazy. Jacob, thank you for that question. Um, what I touched on at the beginning was the, one of the real problems that we found um, from some of the surveys of animals we've done is that the social networks that exist now do not provide the UI that truly supports animal interaction. Um, so that being said, to answer your question, in future improvements, we are planning push functions where a, a, pet, a pet parent or pet assistant can push content from the platform into existing social networks so that uh, their other human friends can see all of the amazing things that their animals are doing. Um, that's just not in the initial uh, MVP right now. Thank you. Question here in, oh, to you, Courtney. That you can, oh, I've got a microphone, wow. Is there any way that you can monetize this so that you can give um, some money to pet charities to help the less fortunate cute people, I mean animals? Un one of the unfortunate things um, about this presentation so far is that the two experts in the front did not ask the question about um, how we plan to grow Ferenci, and I'll answer my own question, which will touch on what you have asked. Um, one of the biggest barriers that Ferenci has in its existence is access of pets to engaged pet parents with mobile devices that want to post contact on their behalf. So one of the major initiatives, both selfishly to grow our own network and to help those pets is to make sure that we pair with organizations that can help pair human assistance with animals that do not have one. So groups like the ASPCA, local shelters, et cetera, those are gonna be our primary charitable outreach um, uh, avenues because we truly believe we cannot grow the network if every pet doesn't have a human assistant with a mobile device. Got a question here in the front as well. 
So I've been working in mental health and psychiatry for about 40 years. What are you trying and to say? This, I'm saying that I'm <laughs> saying that there that there are going to be well, yeah, there are going to be amazing mental health benefits that I don't even know if you'll be aware of from this. I think it's an amazing buffer to the kind of interactions that we usually do, um, and going to inspire a different type of social interaction. My questions are, in a nutshell, if you could say something about how you were, what inspired you to do this, and then have you considered? Uh, my husband's a veterinarian, and he's a mobile veterinarian, and so considered possibly the mobile veterinarians and the mobile groomers as a good little um, population to tap into. Okay, so to touch on your first question, uh, in a nutshell, say the question again, I'm sorry. I just... uh, what, what inspired you? Uh, what inspired me? Um, one of the things that I've always noticed, and I think anybody who interacts on common social platforms really does notice, is that one of the most engaging types of content happens to be animal content. And in a world where new social networks are popping up every day, you see a trend towards specialization or networks that are focused on specific types of owners. Um, so recognizing that the content itself, the gold, if you will, is among the most engaging of anything published on the internet today, and that the pet parents or human pet assistants are some of the most engaged owners from an industry perspective, how much they spend on their pets, how much they interact. Um, it seemed like an obvious network that did not have an existing um, competitor that shared, uh, was open to the whole animal kingdom, um, necessarily. Um, so that would be the answer to the first. Um, as to the mental health piece that you touched on first, um, that is an amazing point and I had never considered it and thank you and that's why we do presentations like this. So I really, really appreciate it. Um, and then to answer your last question of have we tapped into or thought about tapping into veterinary or groomers, um, we've talked about pet service providers kind of in aggregate or, um, or in, you know, in generalizations, but we had not considered that as a, uh, as a primary means. So that's a great idea. Um, we could add support that would allow people to request a groomer or request a mobile veterinarian if there was an emergency. Um, that could be a, a huge benefit. So, um, yeah, thank you for, for the idea. So, appreciate it. A couple of quick questions for you to follow on with that. I'm, I'm curious about your user adoption for the actual uh, apps that you're releasing. What, what type of testing did you do? Did you go through any, like, beta testing before uh, putting the apps into the store for your launch or...? So we've had Fervency on a development server for about 60 days, um, although we've been working on the platform and kind of the concept for the last year. One of the things that, that kind of our team has really, um, really had discussions about is launching a absolute basic platform early um, so that we can get feedback um, and, and really see how the initial users will begin using the platform. Um, we, while we have a base of, of friends and, and you know, um, compatriots that have animals and that, that speak for animals. Um, we really wanted to get a unbiased view of what people's opinions would be on the application, on the UI, et cetera. So our plan was to create a absolute minimum, launch that, and then try to tap into the feedback of the early users. The other kind of touching point on social networks is it's no fun if no one's there, obviously. So one of the things that Fervency built in or that is part of our overall strategy is the concept of Fervency itself by giving points and awarding um, or, or gamifying the initial usage, um, posting content, following other pets, et cetera, we can at least hope to keep, uh, keep users engaged in the first few weeks after they download the app while we start getting some other users in the network um, um, online. Question on your left. Hello. Good morning, yeah, great presentation. I think it's a great idea. Thank you. It seems to be right now kind of focused on dogs, cats, and birds. Have you, uh, well, there's a, a pretty cool uh, reptile and amphibian community here in Kansas City. Have you, have you tapped into that? Well, the name Fervency is a uh, clever um, tie-in to the word currency um, to imply the, the point system. Uh, Fervency is designed to welcome all members of the domesticated animal kingdom. So that would include ferrets, bunny rabbits, gerbils, hamsters, uh, lizards, um, reptiles, snakes, etc. So yes, they would be more than welcome to be included as well. Very cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Question again on your left. Um, okay, well you're talking about just having domestic animals, but I was just wondering if you guys have ever considered using it maybe as like a marketing sort of tool for zoos or national parks where they could follow um, like a monitored animal in the wild or a zoo animal? That's a great question. Um, the, for 
So to answer the question of have we considered pairing with zoos, et cetera, no, we had not. Great idea, thank you. Um, but to that extent, um, we'd have to evaluate those relationships individually and very carefully. Um, obviously, there are some huge concerns right now about animals in captivity. There's been a lot of news um, recently about SeaWorld's um, discontinuation of their orca show, et cetera. So we'd want to make sure that we carefully evaluated each relationship so that we weren't using this to exploit an individual organization's attempt to brand or, um, or, or popularize a not great situation. Um, additionally, that's why I continue to say domesticated animals, so um, rare animals, animals that don't belong in captivity, et cetera, we're gonna have to evaluate that really, really closely. Um, you know, Siegfried and Roy, maybe, but a regular guy with a pet tiger, probably not. Um, so that's kind of something we have to kind of look at as a gray area and an area we better define going forward. I think that, that touches on a great question. Uh, what is your plan for monitoring the system? Because sure. Uh, at some point uh, in every social media platform, there is that guy, that girl, those people, people acting out, abusing the system and the platform itself, not only for, uh, for self-marketing, uh, but also abuse and, and things like that. So do you guys have a monitoring system in place and will there be moderators? So at launch, every piece of content will be able to be flagged for inappropriateness and it'll end up in a queue for us to evaluate. Um, I think at the beginning, I, I don't foresee a ton of questionable content right at the beginning, but definitely one of the items for us to address early on in the development and growth process is defining a set of terms and conditions that kind of um, uh, puts some, some wording to the, uh, to the gray areas there. So um, we don't have a term set uh, that clearly define it yet, but that's definitely a first thing to do. But you can flag inappropriate content immediately anyway. Question for you here on, on your right. Um, I'm curious, tell us a little bit about um, Fernsey's team right now, like who, who works with you, kind of what have you set up as far as infrastructure for that team, especially if you're giving users the ability to do things like flag content as inappropriate, who's monitoring that, watching these things? Uh, so the, the quick answer um, to that, the, the Fernsey team is comprised of two individuals. Um, one is Penny Nielsen, who is a, um, a retriever, Poodle Mix. Um, she is the chief pet executive officer and chief marketing officer for the group. Um, I'm her human assistant for obvious reasons. She could not give the presentation and field questions. Um, she actually was here today, but unable to um, sit still long enough to actually come up and field some of these questions herself. So she's with her mom outside. Um, the second answer is our um, chief technology officer or chief developer. Um, his name is Jax Hillsman. Um, he uh, is, uh, is the um, the, the pet counterpart to Tyler Hillsman, a, a local developer in the area who helped put together the application. Um, those two animals specifically um, uh, are, are the, uh, the leadership team, if you will, for the, for the organization. Um, the human counterparts, however, um, will be uh, probably the primary um, monitors in the, in the queue, so um, constant reviewing of it on a day-to-day on -day basis is, is part of our, our kind of daily checklist. Um, and then, as uh, has been a, a kind of sticky situation in the Silicon Prairie and the Silicon Valley, um, as I just mentioned, we have two dogs on our, our leadership team. We are looking um, at pursuing um, a more diverse leadership team with per potential cats, uh, birds, et cetera. Um, and, and it is a mixed gender, 50-50, so uh, Jax is a, a boy and um, Penny is a girl, so we do have one of the most diverse boards, um, we believe, in the social uh, network space right now. Your story is on brand every time, and I love it. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, you've answered kind of some questions about uh, your potential for like your revenue stream, but how, how are you funded now, and, and what are you thinking like long term as far as raising capital, if needed? So uh, I like to pride myself on honesty and transparency. We are completely self-funded. We don't have any capital whatsoever. This has been built in spare time. Um, and we intend in the early phases to kind of uh, measure the growth and how people use it, take feedback, implement that back into the system, and in the early, uh, in the early weeks and, and months of Fernsey's development, try to figure out if we have something here, um, and then kind of take it from there. So, um, I wish I had a more developed plan to tell you, but we really are, are kind of, and I know bootstrapping is such a clever term to use in these things, but we're really um, kind of uh, working, working in our spare time right now and then um, gonna try to see, see what we have, if you will. 
So I get the gamification part to keep your users engaged. Sure. Um, with the, which I think is a good idea. The, the folks out there today who are posting content about their pets, it, mostly it seems to be YouTube and Facebook. YouTube, they get views, right? So that's their, and, and, it's, and it's a habit. And the same thing with Facebook, they're already there. They get a ton of likes when they post something. So how, what strategies are you going to use to get them off of those platforms, or at least for this type of content, or at least you know, use yours as an additional, a, additional channel for them to, to post? Because these are like ingrained habits for them, right? Of course, so um, to answer your question of how do we incentivize them or get them to want to transition to our network versus some of the networks they're on. Um, as I said in the very beginning of the presentation, Fernsey is developed to reward animals first. On YouTube, if you are a popular enough advertiser and, uh, or popular enough poster, you get lots of views and you can start sharing in Google's um, advertising revenue um, pool. Um, revenue that is paid out in human dollars and is realized by the human counterpart as a benefit. Um, Fernsey, from its base, um, as, we, as we kind of pair and experiment with some pet partners here in the area, um, we'll provide realized awards to the animals based on, on the level of content they achieve, something that no other network provides, um, a specific um, treat or reward, if you will, for successful posting and, uh, and creating engaging content. Question on your left. Could you talk more about the interface? Um, what shows up in a feed, is it what's local, is it what's popular, is it who I choose to connect with, and how do I interact with the sure. interface? So on Ferency, you'll be able to toggle between two major feeds. One, and I'll sh this is on a, a rear projection thing, but um, one feed is all, so you'll be able to see at, at least the onset a stream of discovery of all pets posting within the network. Um, obviously, as the group grows and as the, uh, uh, the pet user base grows, this is gonna become a very quick moving stream. So um, we'll have to talk about how we, um, how we choose posts that appear in there, but they'll be an all stream. And then you'll see over here, you'll be able to swipe left and go to a chase screen, which will pull up a list of only the pets that your pet has decided to chase. Um, additionally, Ferency will reward those pets based on their Ferency values in a sort of uh, a, a tally or, or pet um, influencer um, page as well within this top screen here. Um, these are all test accounts that we've had on here. We'll remove them, except for Penny. She gets to stay in Jax. But um, we will uh, we'll also have a top or most influential pets for people to check out, so. Chris, on your right. Okay, so one final question for you. What can we as a community do to help you? So as a community, um, and, and the main reason we came here today is to tell the story of Fernsey and to ask um, as supporters of the Kansas City Entrepreneur or Group if you can go home, um, follow Fernsey on Twitter, and then once the app is released next week in the App Store for those with iOS devices, download the app if you are a, a human spokesperson for a pet, play around with it, give us feedback, see if you like us, tell us with absolute honesty what you don't like about it, and help us provide the answers of, one, is this something that, that really has the ability to, uh, to change um, the way pets interact with each other? And two, um, if it is, uh, how can we improve it and how can we continue to develop it? So that would be the, the greatest thing the community could give to me. Um, did you have a question up here also? A final one? Right. Okay. All right, perfect. So thank you, everybody, so much. Um, thanks to the students that came out. Um, just really appreciate the opportunity. So Thank you, Chris. Thank you so much. Have a great morning. OK, we have a couple of uh, quick announcements today. Um, we actually hopefully have three live announcements. So I'm going to invite Morgan and John up. I think Adam's running a little bit late. Wow, that's hard to follow, right? It's like catter day every day. But I have maybe the only thing that you can follow up with that. I am Morgan from the library, and normally we would read you stories and we'd have cookies and milk. But for GW, we're going to have beer and Thai food. I know, earmuffs, you guys. So. If you would like to join us, thank you, at the library on Friday, November 22nd for GEW, we'll be discussing the business of microbrews, and we will have free tastings and Thai food. Thanks. And what a better way to start off Global Entrepreneurship Week than, sorry, Kansas City Startup Weekend. Um, 
We have Kansas City Startup Weekend coming through the Sprint Accelerator this Friday through Sunday. It's a 52-hour event um, where we get developers, designers, and businessy folk together um, to basically create a startup over that time period. Um, we actually have a promotional code that we'd like to share with 1 million Cups viewers, even you on the live stream. Um, so we love 1MCKC. Um, if you if you go to kcsw.info and then go to the Eventbrite page and then type that in, um, you get a $10 off promo. Um, it's a really cool event. We're looking for people to get involved at um, any point. So um, come find me after 1 million cups and uh, happy to be here. Thank you. Adam? Come sprinting in off the street to make an announcement. Um, uh, so we have Startup Grind next week with Barnett Helsberg. Uh, he sold Helsberg Diamonds to uh, uh, Warren Buffett, so I think he has a pretty good story to tell. Uh, if you look in the handout, uh, there is, uh, we're offering $5 tickets for anyone that was here today at 1MC with the code 1MC. Um, and it's an hour conversation with Barnett, hearing his life story and kind of business lessons learned. An hour of networking before and after with food and beer provided for five bucks, so not bad. Anyways, hope you guys can make it on Tuesday. Adam, your sheet says six dollars. There's a one dollar Eventbrite fee, sorry. <laughs> Thank you for all of these events and more information um, for GEW. Please look at our handout for this week, and um, I know KC Source Link has all of the events on their website, so check that out too. With 90 plus, we couldn't fit them all on the announcement sheet. So I would like to welcome our second presenter, uh, Josh Shookman with Social Change Nation. Thanks, Martin. Thank you. All right, well, great crowd today. Thank you all for turning out. Uh, as Courtney mentioned, I'm Josh, and I'm the Chief Inspiration Officer at Social Change Nation, where we get about the business every day of empowering other businesses that make a dollar and a difference. And we do that in two main ways. Uh, we provide online education for aspiring social entrepreneurs. So this is the person who's just dying to launch their social venture. They're ready to take the leap. And what they need is a program to really help them in those first months to accelerate their launch. That's really our target with that. Um, and then we also do direct work with startup social ventures. So here's where I'm going to take us today. I want to first of all start out by defining social entrepreneurship. As you can see, that's something that's pretty central to what we do. So I'll talk a lot about that. Um, I'll talk about how we use new mediums like podcasting as really the backbone of our, our marketing and how we build a community of customers. And then I'll move in to talk about our direct work, work with startup social ventures. And I'll close out by talking about a lean experiment we ran to really launch this online education as a main way that we want to scale what we're up to as Social Change Nation. So let's go ahead and break in right away by defining social entrepreneurship. Now, there are lots of definitions out there, but I think this one's really fitting. Uh, it's the attempt to draw upon business techniques to find solutions to social problems. Something I would add to that is that you can find a social entrepreneur by the way that they brand themselves and tell their story, and then I think most importantly, the way they measure success. So I'll give you a local example of that. Life Equals is a company here in town that sells multivitamins, and for every multivitamin they sell, they donate one to a child in need. If you were to go to their website, you'd find a ticker in the upper right that will tell you exactly how many vitamins they've donated. So they're putting it front and center that that's one of their core success metrics, one of the ways that they define their business. And I think that's a really defining point for a social entrepreneur. So moving back now to talk about Social Change Nation, uh, really our heart and what we're aspiring to do is to create a community of people who are aspiring to be social entrepreneurs. The main way we do that is through our podcast. I host it. It's called Voices of Social Change. It features a weekly interview with an established social entrepreneur. I ask the same set of questions to each entrepreneur, so you'll get the same set of questions, but a different experience. And again, that audience that we're targeting is really that aspiring social entrepreneur, someone who's ready to take that leap. Our whole goal with this is something you might have heard of before called the freemium model, where we're using the podcast as a way to get people to know, like, and trust us as they listen over the course of time. And then as they come into our community and spend more time with us, our hope is that we'll be able to provide services that add more value for them that we can then charge for. Um, another way you might have seen this before is essentially a funnel approach. Um, so at the top end, you have a free giveaway, which for us is our podcast. 
that we have people listen to and then they subscribe to, spend more time with us. And then as they're staying in our community and interacting with us, we hope to provide higher level, higher value services to them. So moving down the funnel, you could have a low cost front end product. In our example, it could be an ebook. Um, at the bottom end of the funnel is where you have your most high priced products. These are high touch, um, coaching, uh, classes, that kind of thing is, is what you'd be looking at. For us at Social Change Nation, we've done pretty well with the free giveaway, giving out that podcast and getting people to subscribe to listen. And we've done pretty well with the high priced products at the end, which I'll talk about in a moment. What we've been challenged with are the two middle parts of the funnel, finding these low cost items that people do want to pay a few dollars for that provide them that kind of value has been something that we've been, been challenged with and something we're trying to work on as we try to scale. So let me go ahead and talk about some of these higher priced direct services that we're offering. One of the main revenue drivers with Social Change Nation is working with cause-based startups. So these are companies that really want to build some kind of social good into their brand. And I'll give you a couple local examples here. Copper Security is a local company um, that's actually launching today on Indiegogo. And the reason they're launching on Indiegogo, they have a unique security device that's specifically for residential real estate investors with a lot of uh, vacant properties. What they found, though, was that there were a lot of community organizations like Habitat for Humanity that had the same problem with vacant homes. A lot of break-ins, copper would get stolen out of them, criminal activity would occur in the homes, causes a lot of problems for the neighborhood. And so they're building their company. As they make sales to the residential real estate investors, they're also making donations to these organizations. Social Change Nation works with them to help them tell that story, help them build that brand. And we really worked with them heavily to craft the story of the Indiegogo campaign, their video, and bring the necessary partners to the table. Uh, we do a similar thing with Wonder We in the sense that we build out their content. Wonder We, again, is a local company. It's a crowdfunding platform that's focused on raising awareness and funds for Christian causes. So we're helping build out their content, tell their story, and build that cause-driven brand. So that work is fun and, and really important, and I think keeps our finger on the pulse of really a lot of trends in the way that business is shifting, but it's very, very hard to scale that. And so that was a real challenge for us as we tried to grow Social Change Nation. So what I did in early fall was essentially launched a lean experiment using relationships I already had. So I went to some of my top interviews on my podcast and made arrangements with them to basically say, hey, if I found an aspiring social entrepreneur who wanted to be coached by you, would you be willing to do that? I made those arrangements and then also had an outline of 10 classes that I could provide, created a landing page around this, and then offered that up to my community. We were able to close a couple seats in that where the people coming through are getting direct one-on-one -on -one coaching by these established social entrepreneurs. They're matched with someone that fits the business that they want to start. They have access to a private Facebook group and 10 classes. So this was a pilot program, and again, we were able to close those seats, but as I did that, I really worked with those students to make sure that this program was really what they wanted it to be, but also to develop a program that would be a little bit more hands-off for us to help us scale. And so that pretty well brings you up to date on the main things that we have cooking at Social Change Nation. Uh, the last thing that I would say is if you know an aspiring social entrepreneur, we'd love to have them as part of the community. It's just really an online hub around social entrepreneurship, so we'd love to have them check it out, um, and feel free to put us in touch. And with that, I'll open myself up to questions. Thank you, Josh. <laughs> We'd like to go ahead and open it up to our panelists to start with the questions. There we go. Okay, I love this idea. This is something that um, you know we do in, in our own business, and um, I feel like working within the nonprofit community a lot is I would love to see more of them transition to a business model that allowed them to sell or have a product um, and also at the same time push their initiatives forward and should partner up with other businesses. It's something that I've been trying to figure out uh, how to do within the film community. Mm -hmm. I don't really have a question per se, but I would love to follow up with you later to see how we might uh, engage our local film community with uh, businesses mm -hmm. that need our local film resources and things of that nature. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Great pitch. Um, good job. So I'm trying to wrap my head around your business model. Mm -hmm. What, and I understand that right now it seems to be more about education, is that right? Yes. Okay, 
So, so specifically, uh, let's just start there. Specifically within the realm of, of social entrepreneurship education, um, what, and, and I understand the podcast part, mm -hmm. but beyond that, what, what are the products that you're actually selling? Yeah. Right now, the only product that we're actually selling is that essentially virtual accelerator uh, with those coaching partnerships that, that I've developed. Uh, as far as the, the problem that we feel like we're solving, um, that was a real challenge for me, um, figuring it out as, as I grew. And one thing I realized was that I was just kind of trying to be this broad education provider and didn't really have my eyes focused on exactly what that meant. Uh, and so I went out actually in the process of developing that online course and interviewed a lot of my target customers just trying to understand their pain points. And from that, what I found was that a lot of times they would say, in other words, I would ask them a question, you, know, you want to start, why haven't you started yet? And they would always say time and money. And as I dug a little bit deeper, what I really found was that for a lot of them, it was that they thought they needed more time and money, but what would really be helpful is if they could have a plan to get some small incremental wins along the way that would snowball into bigger victories. So to answer your question in terms of the products we offer, that's really what I try to focus on, is how do I give you those little wins along the way? How do I provide you with a program and a coach who can give you those little wins along the way that will allow you to take the leap into your own venture? Okay, and then follow up to that, yeah. um, you mentioned startups in your pitch. So is your, your coaching content and your approach geared more towards startups and new businesses? Because it sounds like you mentioned you know, when, when they're just getting started, how do they, they like build this into the fabric of their business model or more established companies that want to start doing this? Yeah, I, I really do target startup social entrepreneurs. And that there again, initially when I started out, I just had this whole broad idea of helping any business that wanted to become a social entrepreneur. I've really found that my niche is that startup. Okay, great. Um, and, and how many people are there on your team right now? Uh, so two, I, myself and then one other part-time person. And then also have a, kind of some different uh, contract things that I do, like growthgeeks.com, which if you haven't checked out, I'd highly recommend. Helps a lot with social media growth and just kind of some small one-off services that, that you can do. So contract a lot of it out. Cool. And then the podcasts, are, are you having the entrepreneurs come onto the podcasts <laughs> with you and use that as sort of like a, a channel for them? Or how, how does that work as far as the relationship between the podcasts and the companies that you're coaching? Yeah. So I interview them by and large on Skype. So I'm interviewing social entrepreneurs all around the world. And then for them, it's a good chance to share their story, but then that also creates a good joint marketing channel um, because they do usually use it as, as a marketing promotion for themselves, sharing their story, and so we can jointly promote that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. yeah, I think it does. Okay. I think it does. And then have you thought, I mean, this is probably a good, maybe the reason that you, you wanted to chat with him. It, this seems like it, it, would, it would be potentially a natural fit for, to partner with creative agencies. Um, I know that there are already some agencies out there that really specialize in, in just social entrepreneurship, you know, social good. But uh, I also know that it's a real challenge for agencies to, to work with startups in a lot of cases. So, so anyway, have you thought about you know, those types of partnering opportunities? You know, I haven't. That's, that's a new idea to me. Um, but it sounds like something I, I should definitely check out. So that would be to where... Um, I would kind of help make the links between the two companies. Yeah, because there's what you're. It sounds like what you're doing is is definitely overlapping with something with like a creative agency would provide. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, especially in the area of, of social goods. So, it, but but again, like this might be a little bit too early for them. It might be a good feeder into into agencies, and that's why you know they might be interested. Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of, I mean, essentially what you're doing is you're providing coaching and, and content and, and marketing channels to social entrepreneurs, which is awesome. Um, and especially in the startup world, and it's the best place to do is like get them, get them started with it right off the bat. Um, but it, it might be a good fit for a couple of agencies and there's a few better places to do that in, in K, than KC. So that's why I thought about it. Okay, no, sounds good, thank you. All right, we're ready to open it up to the to the audience, um, but before we do, I have a quick question. How would like a group of, let's say, dogs or cats connect with you on this? <laughs> Where, are you, pig ears, you think that would be a good thing? Okay, right. let's get serious. All right, who's got a question? Actually, I've, I've got a question up here uh, for you. 
Tell us a little bit more. You, you touched a little bit on your niche market, right? Tell us a little bit more about that niche market and like how you would connect with them, reach out to them or engage them um, with your product or service. Yeah, so my niche market, a few things that I've found about them, um, a lot of times, or almost always, they'll be working in some kind of a day job, oftentimes at a nonprofit, so they have that kind of natural social good bent. Um, they tend to be younger, 25 to 35, somewhere in the millennial generation. Um, and then they have that, that desire to start a venture. And the way that I tend to target my audience, there are actually a lot of Facebook groups around social entrepreneurship, a lot of LinkedIn groups, um, a lot of informal communities around it. Um, and so it's really focusing on, on those terms like social entrepreneurship or starting a social venture um, or what I go out and look for. The other thing that I've found is from the podcast, everyone that I interview really has a following that is kind of naturally aligned with this idea. So when I do an interview, I really work hard to get in front of that audience as well and find that I run into a lot of my target candidates there. Okay, Josh, we got a question in the middle. So a lot of people want to put their money in products that do, do good. So I'm wondering if you've thought about um, creating some kind of platform where you would collect these uh, companies you're working with so that people could go to one place and say, you know, I'm looking for clothes or I'm looking for whatever it is, and then they would be able to um, put their purchases toward doing good. Yeah, funny you should mention that. <laughs> Socialgoodshopping.com um, <laughs> is something that, that I created with uh, a partner here in town, uh, Grant Wish. He runs Cause Artist. Um, we're really lucky to have him as well. He's, he's one of the top names, top brands, really, that is reporting on what's going on with social good brands. So we created a short guide at, at socialgoodshopping.com. It's free, you can download that. That's some of the 50 companies. Um, that was just kind of a start, that's a PDF, so that'll profile a few of them. Uh, there's another site though out there called Shop With Meaning that is more of, I think what you're, you're talking about, Leslie, where it would be uh, a directory and you can select based on cause, you can select based on type of item. I'm mean, again, that's shopwithmeaning.com. So that's out there uh, and we tried it with the guide uh, what I found was it, was it was really, really time consuming and I didn't really have the background to create the technological back end of it and it just didn't really end up being in my area of strength. That was what I, what I found out. But the good news is Shop With Meaning is doing it real well. Uh, Social Good Shopping is another good one to just profile 50 companies if you want to see some of the top ones out there now. Okay, so maybe I, maybe I missed it and I uh, just was browsing through your website really quick. Um, as someone engaged in social change, uh, what is the, where is social change nation as a company giving back? Yeah, so great question. Uh, my personal cause, and, and I, I do actually list it on the website too, my personal cause is, is working with refugees. Uh, it's something I've, I've done for a long time. Newly arriving refugees coming into the United States that are resettled here. Uh, simple tasks like getting a driver's license, finding an apartment are really, really challenging when you're in a new culture. And so what I've done for a long time is just partnered with a family to help them really navigate the system. Uh, so that's the cause that's near and dear to my heart, and that's the cause that I've really Focus social change on in terms of, of how we give back. So I don't I don't know if you've maybe touched on this already, but can you share a little bit about you know what really in, inspired you to go this direction with your purpose? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Milton. So my journey to social change nation really began way back in 2003. Believe it or not, I was trying to be an actor and had applied for all kinds of acting schools in New York and LA. Got rejected from every single one of them, and so decided to take a year off and did a little AmeriCorps program in Cleveland called City Year. Uh, most of us have probably heard of City Year now, it's here in Kansas City, but that program really laid the foundation for everything that I have done with my life. Uh, basically, you'd go out and we were serving a community for a year, I, I worked in, in inner city schools in Cleveland, but they would always bring us back and have us reflect on why we were doing this service, what it meant to our lives, and what that did for me was laid a foundation to really always be thinking around those questions. It, it set me on a career trajectory where I worked for a few years at uh, a few nonprofits, um, and then moved into a for-profit company, uh, the Dave Ramsey Show, which is very, very mission-driven, but also a very profitable company, where I was, which was where I saw those two worlds coming together. Um, so the short answer, it began with City Year, and City Year is really the thread that has just carried through my entire life and, and inspired me around these stories and around building a cause-based business. Question the center. All right, hi Josh. Hey, um, 
I don't know if you mentioned, but I'm a part of your social good venture group here in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. Did you talk about that? I didn't. Okay, because I was wondering, uh, sitting here thinking, and you, you do the blogging and the podcasting and the coaching, and then this local group. What's your long-term vision? What is it that you plan on focusing on, or do you continue to always do all of these different things? What do you think is the most important way for you to have impact? Yeah. I think if you'd asked me that question eight to 12 months ago, I would have said all of those things. <laughs> uh, but as, as most entrepreneurs, we learn along the way that focus is really, really important. At my heart, I'm a teacher. I love teaching, and I love helping people realize their dreams. And so long run, that's really what I want to be all about, is, is building out these coaching programs and helping people who are on the verge, just dying to start a social venture and, and really want to put in the work I want to help them accelerate that journey and get the resources and tools they need to do it. Josh, I got a question to your right, near the back, okay. on the side. Sure. Right. Uh, so you mentioned uh, earlier that your focus is really helping people that are kind of starting their entrepreneur journey. So my question is, at what point are you really stepping in more or pulling back a little bit more? Or is your goal to really create this as a self-regulatory kind of uh, program that somebody can tap into without really... Yeah, resources. great question. And to be honest with you, that's been a, a big challenge for us in a way. You know, I mentioned at the end, I'm essentially running a lean startup experiment where I, I, I got some students into that program and was working with them to develop the program. What I found with that was a good and a bad thing. Uh, I didn't set a timeline with it, and so I'm continuing to work with them even beyond any timeline that I thought. That's good for me because I'm trying to develop that program, but in terms of scaling, it's, it's not going to be good. So a big lesson of that was as I scale, I'm going to have to put a timeline on. My initial thought was three months to get you the tools you need to lay the foundation and launch. Um, but whether that becomes a timeline or not, it's, it's I think very important with these kinds of things to have a timeline when you're doing a coaching program like that. But as far as building the business and the marketing, uh, part of the, the marketing plan, and this isn't just me, what, what, what a lot of podcasters and content producers will do, is it'll depend on the fact that a lot of people receiving that free content will be with you for quite a while, and sometimes maybe even a year or two where they're absorbing that free content. So that's ongoing, and the hope is that when they're ready then to take that step, then they'll move into the more defined services that you can charge for. Question, back left. Oh, thank you, Josh, for the nice presentation. I think you've got a very nice concept. My name is Tatum Fikwe from South Africa. Um, just wanted to find out, um, do you also consider like scaling up your concept uh, to international uh, markets? Uh, because it has a, a really good chance of changing a lot of communities around the world. Thanks. Just make sure I understand the question. Getting into the tr traditional businesses? International markets, like going outside to different markets. countries, yes. Okay, yeah, it's funny. Uh, my main paying clients actually came from Canada, so uh, I'm international already. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Uh, I have a lot of international listeners to my podcast. Uh, to be honest, as far as social entrepreneurship, this is just my opinion, but I think that Britain and Australia are a step or two ahead of us, so I've gotten a lot of listeners from there and a lot of interaction from those countries. Um, but absolutely, you're mentioning South Africa. I think social entrepreneurship in Africa, South America, where I've spent some time, is incredibly vibrant in a lot of exciting ways. So it's absolutely uh, part, of, part of my plan and, and a place I want to get involved with and a story I want to help tell. I have a question about the podcasting. So uh, it, you had said or in your presentation um, that it was a, a, a newer resource, uh, which would be, I think people are just kind of businesses are just kind of getting into something that's been being done since almost the beginning of the internet in one way right. or another. The market is fairly flooded. I could listen to every podcast in my iPod from the time I wake up until I go to bed and still not cover all of them. And you are introducing even more companies into the market that may either podcast with you or start podcasts on their own. How do you advise that they stand apart? What are, what are well, it's obvious what your podcast is offering uh, and in training and in that freemium model, but as far as the next 15 to 20 clients that come your direction, how do you grow each of them differently in their own atmosphere? Yeah, 
Great question, and, and I would say a couple things to that. I think, first of all, just in terms of the general podcasting landscape, one of the reasons it's more exciting to me than blogging, for example, is I, I can't remember the exact numbers, but there are literally tens of millions of blogs. I think right now there are just, it's a couple hundred thousand active podcasts, and podcasting is really growing as a medium. I think blogging is, is a little more saturated, so that's one of the reasons I like podcasting, just as kind of a general answer to your question. But in terms of how I would, would differentiate people, I would say a couple things. I think that interview podcasts are getting pretty saturated. Everyone's starting a podcast where they're interviewing someone, and I'm saying that as someone who interviews people. Uh, so I would recommend, and one thing I'm actually moving into myself is more of a storytelling form. We're actually gonna move into a format where we're telling the story of one social venture over the course of multiple episodes with lessons along the way. So I think that that's one way you really differentiate yourself. Uh, podcasting is a, a very artistic medium, and if you can find a way to be very creative and tell a story, that'll really set you apart because there's not very many podcasts that are doing that right now. Uh, the other thing I would say is that there are tons of niches out there, and you don't actually need that many people on a podcast, depending on what you're doing, you don't actually need that many people on a podcast to create a business model around it. I'll give you an example. One of the biggest podcasts, or I should say one of the biggest, but one of the more well-known podcasts, the guy actually focuses on wood carving, carving wood boats, I think, specifically. Probably has about 10,000 listeners, uh, but for himself and a few others has created a, a fully functional, very profitable, small-time business because it's a very, very niche focus. So if you have that niche focus, I think you're automatically going to stand apart because there won't really be anyone else in your space, so there'll be very few people in your space doing what you're doing. Josh, question on your right. Hey, Josh. Um, I, I obviously love the idea of social entrepreneurship. Um, how much of this do you see sort of eating into the, um, the traditional capitalist entrepreneurship model? Do you see as it going forward, how much of that, uh, how much do you expect this sort of social, social entrepreneurship concept to grow and, and take over, hopefully, maybe some big piece of, of the, For sure. yeah. Yeah. Well, you run into a lot of different opinion, opinions on that, but I'll, I'll definitely tell you mine. I don't think it's eating into traditional entrepreneurship, and I don't see these two things as competition. I see social entrepreneurship as becoming business as usual. Um, I see traditional companies really moving in this direction, if for no other reason than the fact that millennials are becoming a huge factor uh, in, they're becoming a huge consumer group, and they are demanding that businesses do well for the world and express that in their brand. Uh, there are a lot of stats out there that show they'll gravitate towards those kinds of brands. And so, you know, there's some gray area there because sometimes then businesses are just doing it for marketing purposes. Um, but at the end of the day, I really think that this is the way that traditional companies are going to move. And yeah. Got a uh, question for you here, Josh. So tell me this, like, what is your ultimate goal, right, with your business and how do you plan to get there? Yeah. So my ultimate goal is I'd like to become the online hub for startup social entrepreneurs. I want to be the top of mind person for anyone who's looking to get started up in this space. And I want them to be able to come to me and get all the resources they want to get started, a lot of them for free, and then if they want to take it to a higher level, uh, then of course we have our coaching and classes and that kind of thing. How I plan to get there uh, is <laughs> a great question. Um, so one of the biggest things, and I'll, I'll tell you this is a lesson that I learned along the way. When I began, uh, like I think most entrepreneurs, I fell in love with creating. I had this great idea, I wanted to be a teacher, I wanted to be the, the social entrepreneurship podcaster, right? And so I spent about 80% of my time creating the content around that, and only 20% of the time sharing the story. What that meant was I'd created this beautiful online, I looked up about eight months later, and I'd created this beautiful online hub that no one was really seeing. So I flipped that ratio, and now I really spend about 80% of my time sharing the story. And the way that I do that is through content. I do a lot of guest blog posts. I try to share my podcast on as many relevant sites as I can. And that's really been a big thing that's driven people back to our way, back our way. So the short answer to your question, Milton, for me, it's all about growing that community. And the best way to grow that community going forward is for me to get uh, relevant content, valuable content in front of as many networks and as many people as I possibly can. Great job, Josh. Before we let you go, quick question. Um, what can we as a community do for you? Uh, well, I would just go back to what I was saying at the end. If you know an aspiring social entrepreneur, let us know about what we're up to at Social Change Nation. If there's something we could be doing better to help them, have them shoot me an email. I'd be glad to do that. Um, but just really anyone who is in the kind of uh, state that I mentioned, really dying to start a social venture, we'd love to connect with them. And if you could just send them our way, that'd be the best thing that, that we could have happen.
Great. Thanks. Great job. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for coming. It's great to have so many new people. Um, we love having high school kids. So uh, if you know if you have a Wednesday off or it's summer and you want to come back, please do bring a friend. Um, we'll be back here next week at, this, at 8 a.m., 8 to 10, which will be a little bit unique, but I hope you guys can make it. And um, we were going to show a video from the Block School, but our bandwidth is having some trouble, so we're going to have to miss that. But I believe, is there an announcement? Is there something in that? Not sure. Is there something in the announcements about the Block, the block School? No? Okay, I'm sorry we can't share that with you. Um, hey, our, the, uh, our organizer team is uh, growing or looking to grow. So if you would be interested in volunteering some of your time and be part of the One Million Cups organizers, uh, please come talk to one of us up front after this program. And uh, thank you so much for coming. We'll see you next week.